Can I make a word about the, the halfway point? Eric, can I make an editorial? Um, Please. Sidebar? Yes. Yeah, so um, I, I, I love this. This is great. Um, total viewership for this is going to be very small. <laughs> um, <laughs> but maybe we do it with like more topical and um, sure. you know, kind of attention-grabbing topics. Um, um, so guys, is SBF going to kill himself or what, what's going <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's to happen? <laughs> So, Mark, I, I, I want to start this podcast by uh, introducing the SBF quote and having us unpack it a little bit. He, he was explaining to a Vox reporter uh, that the ethics were, were a dumb game we woke Westerners play. Uh, and um, I want you to use Joseph Henrik to help explain what is this dumb game or what, what is this game and why is it uniquely a Western well, do you, uh, do you have the rest of the quote? Just to remember. finish it up. Um, if SBF calls say, ethics a, a dumb game we woke Westerners play where we say all the right shibboleths so people will like us. Yeah, so shibboleth, right. So, so shibboleth is kind of the key word in there. It's kind of like, you know, the thing. It's, it's, like, it's almost like the incantation, right? It's almost like it's like a... He's, he's kind of saying we live in like a Harry Potter world where like if you say the words in the right order, people do what you want. Um, which, you know, for him, <laughs> historically worked out pretty well. You know, we'll see. We'll see how well that works going forward. Um... Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's sort of, you know, it's very consistent. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of very consistent. I mean, you know, this, this is an idea with very deep roots. And so, right, there's, there's sort of this pro, there's this pro sociality kind of aspect to it. Um, you know, which is we want other people to prove that, that they're a part of our tribe. Um, and if they're part of our tribe, then therefore, you know, we should extend our protection to them. Um, you know, we want people to believe that they're altruistic. Um, you know, that they have our best interests at heart. And so therefore, you know, we'll do things for them. Um, you know, and then specifically politically, we want, you know, them to, we want, you know, we want people to believe that we're on their political side. So they'll kind of extend that, you know, that kind of, that kind of umbrella protection to us as well. Um, and so it, it is, it, I mean, it's, it, he's literally right, right? It's, it's, the, it's these magic incantations where as long as you say the right words in the right order, um, you know, everybody kind of nods and smiles and considers you friendly. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's obviously, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, a, a couple of things. Well, one is, you know, the thing that, gi that gives it away is the cliches, right? And so there's this, there's this great internet term, right? Copy pasta, um, right? Which is like, if, if everybody says the exact same things in the exact same ways, right? Which is sort of what happens, um, then it's easy to just copy and paste, um, or it's easy to have your favorite chat, you know, AI, you know, generate it for you. Um, and so, you know, there, there is some declining signal uh, over time as it just kind of gets, you know, kind of increasingly um, obvious. Um, and then it's just incredibly prone to hacking, right? Um, uh, it, you know, it's just incredibly prone to people with bad intent, you know, basically saying the words, not meaning them. Um, you know, there's, there's always this question of whether you can ever tell anybody's lying by looking at them. And it actually turns out, I think, to be fairly difficult. Um, and so there's this hack where a lot of people with, you know, bad intent, um, you know, will do this and, you know, we, I don't know, we seem to love it. Like it, it seems to be far more important to us, uh, as a species, uh, to fall for this than it does to try to really, uh, be just, you know, discriminatory and try to figure out who's actually, you know, saying what they believe. But, but this, going back to the weird Henrik thing, which we haven't defined, and I don't know if our like as yet unformed audience is like smart enough to know what it is without us like telling it, but it's this book by, by Joe Henrik. And the whole point is like Western educated and industrialized rich. And what's the D again? Democratic. Democratic. Um, and one of the unique things about weird is basically Northern, it's basically Northern European Protestant culture, right? Is what it is, right? Which has been exported through the Anglo-Saxon channel in a huge way. And one of the novel things about weird is that it's willing to confer dignity to strangers, right? Like the fact that, which is fairly unusual, like we're so used to it, like fish and water, we don't see it. But the thought that we meet a total stranger in a high trust society and are willing to like share a parking spot or a public place or pay taxes for their welfare or whatever is kind of novel. Historically, that, that's not been the case, right? Although obviously the, the model is hugely successful. And so in these weird societies, the ability to fake earnestness gets you a long way because <laughs> earnestness gets you a lot. In a low trust, cynical society, it doesn't get you much of anything. You look kind of like a fool or to use the Israeli phrase, a friar, right? Like literally the chump, right? And nobody wants to be the chump. Um, but yeah, like that, that, that grift kind of only works in a weird society. To some degree. Yeah. And I think you could, you could, you know, take it even a step further, right? It's sort of a, it's an artifact of Christianity, right? Specifically, right? Run through the, ah, the yes. My right. favorite topic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. So Antonio, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk at length about this, but, um, yeah, the, it, you know, it's basically, it's like, you know, the, the, the foundation here is, right, Christianity was the first religion where the religion was decoupled from the concept of a people, right, which is right. to say decoupled from the concept of like a tribe or an ethnicity, right? Um, and so Christianity was the first religion, um, it, you know, where you could just, you could basically just say, I'm a Christian, um, as long as you say that. And, you know, the presumption is, again, that you believe it, but as long as you say that, like, you're, you know, you're kind of in that, 
you're in that tribe and that's sort of an abstracted level of tribalism above the sort of normal ethnic, uh, you know, sort of foundation, uh, historical foundations of tribalism. Um, and so it's this, it's this, yes, it's this, it's this intrinsically sort of Christian, Christian, Christianized, Westernized, you know, point of view, which as Antonio says, has been, you know, proselytized all over the world, you know, whether it transmits through to every other culture uh, and every other kind of people is always, you know, a bit of an open question. And just to highlight that point, because I think it's such a strange conclusion. Again, you don't quite see it because we're also, you know, my, I wouldn't say mired, marinated in liberalism that we kind of don't understand how you would couple religion to ethnicity. But like Tom Holland, who I think we all like, he wrote this book, um, Imperium, was it? Uh, about Dominion. 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 And he, he mentioned in his interview, so you realize the Christians invented the term Judaism, right? That they they invented the term that referred to, oh, the... The, the nature of this belief that responds to the Jewish people before that, right? The, the, the Jews were an ethno state, which belonged to a polity, which belonged to a certain monarchy, which was a certain order. And that's it. The thought that there would be French citizens that happened to be Jewish, right? And, and it took centuries to get there, by the way, even in the Christian world, right? It took Jewish emancipation to get there. And in fact, the Jews kind of fell for it. A lot of reformed Judaism was the thought, you know what? We can actually abstract away Judaism from the fact that I'm a citizen of Germany and France. That didn't quite work out in the 20th century so well as an ideology, but by and large, that was the, that was the Christian mindset. I think, I think what Colin refers to Christianity as a cult, uh, something about like the execution of an obscure criminal. <laughs> and, and and we're all we're all swimming in it today. Yeah. Well, Mark, let, let's go full Nietzsche because I know I know you you you're you're a fan of Nietzsche as am I. Um, and I, he's responsible for one of the biggest criticisms of Christianity. And I think one of the interesting things about Christianity and Tom Holland gets into this as well, although he doesn't hate it nearly as much as Nietzsche does. The elevation of the victim, right? The thought that the divine took human form, and in fact, we elevate and revere the ugly, the oppressed, the ill, and not the wealthy, the powerful, the beautiful. Which, of course. Every culture before Christianity worship, and certainly the Romans did. It's a strange, inver- when you think about it, you, go, you walk into a church, and what is hanging on the wall? Literally this image of a criminal getting tortured to death, right? And that, that is the figure of Godhead. That's, that's very unique and strange. We've gotten ourselves used to it because we all are weird people, right, in the, in the academic sense. But it, it is odd when you think about it. Yes, all right. So what Nietzsche says, right, is that basically in the pre-Christian, in pre-Christian morality, and let's even say, you know, to extend it further, pre-Jewish morality, um, you know, sort of Judeo-Christian morality, uh, in, you know, in the original world, in the ancient world, um, basically the, the, the concepts of strong and weak were the same as the concepts of good and bad. Like they, they mapped that way. And so strong was good, weak was bad. And you, you kind of put yourself in the mindset of like, you know, very, you know, early peoples living under very harsh conditions. You know, it kind of makes sense if you if you kind of think about what that really would have been like. It's like, okay, what matters is survival. Um, okay, what you know, what matters for survival is being strong. Okay, so therefore, that which is strong is good. You know, what 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 is the thing that gets you killed? Being weak. Therefore, anything that's weak is bad, right? And so there was this there was a straight mapping of strength to goodness and and, and weakness to uh, you know, to you know to moral badness. You know, it, Nietzsche calls this you know master morality, right? Uh, you know, carrying forward the you know the sort of morality of the master in a in a in a master slave relationship, or you know, more generally, sort of a strong weak uh, you know relationship, um, right? And then Christianity is the first religion that flips that um, on its head. Um, you know, Judeo Christianity maybe in combination flips that on its head, and, and Christianity is the full realization of that, uh, and basically says, no, actually, we venerate the weak. And of course, that that itself was a pro social a pro social hack, right? Um, it, because it's just on the numbers, right? Just uh, on the numbers, there are a lot more, you know, there are a lot more slaves, you know, than there are masters historically, right? Um, there are a lot more weak people than there are strong people. You know, there are a lot more downtrodden people than there are people on top. You know, in, in any in any you know stru- in, a, in any hierarchy, um, and so therefore Christianity kind of came up with this like very brilliant kind of strategic political <laughs> breakthrough, which was here's how we get the most people on our side. Um, somebody I forget who called for that reason called Christianity the, the final religion, right? It's it's like. Christ, the theory goes like Christianity is the final religion. It's the last religion that can actually hit the mainstream um, because it's the it's the one that basically has numbers on its side. Like it's the one where you're the strongest if you're the part of the you know basically largest possible coalition of the week. Um, and you know, ar- arguably that and sort of secularized versions of that are you know the world that we live in. I've often joked that Christianity is Judaism with product market fit and a growth team, right? And like clearly. St. Paul was the greatest product marketer in like human history. And then he took this weird, he took like Linux and Unix, which never became the desktop. And he turned it into like Mac OS 10 somehow. And he made it the sellable thing that actually like everyone could actually engage by getting rid of the weirdest part of Judaism and then preserving the most interesting and appealing parts of it and actually generalizing it. I, I might get canceled by Jews now, but anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Go, go no, I'll, I'll ask you <laughs> say is, I think I remember listening to Tom Holland talk about his like inspiration for the book. And obviously he's a classicist. 
And he, he was talking about after years of just reading, uh, you know, the primary sources on, on Caesar killing a million Gauls and, and, and Leonidas, just, you know, these these Ubermensch and, and you know, no love for anything weak. It, it felt very foreign living in modern liberalism. And, and right. so that was actually what what got him because he, he's not a religious writer at all. And so I think it, it's kind of an interesting lens for a book to be written about Christianity through a, a classicist size. And then the other one interesting thing about, about that book that kind of stuck with me was the, the Persian influence on Christianity, which I had never heard about, right? You always heard the Judaism and the Greeks, but the idea of the, you know, Darius and, and kind of like good and evil, light and dark, and just kind of this like binary in-group, out-group, and, and you're either with the strong and us or you're against us uh, as, as kind of being a, a motif that kind of get woven into early Christianity. So one thing you mentioned, Mark, is that Christianity is the final religion. I mean, in referring back again to my pull request interview of Tom Holland from like two years ago, he also mentioned, you know, talking about things like what we see in the world today with social justice, wokeness, whatever you want to call it, right? In Tom Holland's definition, that is almost the inevitable outcome of Christianity, right? Like if you pursue injustice in the downtrodden long enough, you get to the point where it's almost Zeno's paradox of injustice. You're, you're expending more and more effort to go after, you know, more cases of injustice. And uh, yeah, I mean, what does that mean then? Is this, is this it then? I mean, this might segue into the end of history thing we're talking about, but I'm curious what, what happens next if it is the, the final religion. Yeah. So, you know, so Nietzsche kind of called this early, right? So Nietzsche was writing around the same time that, you know, Darwin, you know, Darwin's theories of natural selection were starting to become, you know, kind of, you know, essentially proven and, and, and dominant in terms of science. And so Nietzsche kind of abstracted that through to society. Uh, and, 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 you know, and this sort of famous statement was, you know, God is dead, you know, we've killed God and something like we'll never wash the blood off our hands. Um, uh, and, and, you know, basically, right, his, 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 his thesis basically was, um, the way I read it is in an increasingly scientific world, right, in, in a world where you believe in science and in a world where you believe in specifically natural selection and, you know, the evolution, um, you know, the, the supernatural aspects of a religion like Christianity kind of fade away. They're just no longer, you know, plausible. Um, and, and then he, he, he extrapolated from that to be, okay, therefore the value system of Christianity will also fade away. Um, and then, you know, we, we will basically spend the 20th century trying to invent new post-Christian ideologies that will turn out to be, you know, absolute catastrophes. <laughs> and then, you know, sure enough, you know, along comes communism, um, you know, and drops a hundred million bodies and along comes Nazism and fascism, which drops a hundred million bodies. And, you know, he, he, he kind of was right about that. Um, you know. Fortunately, right, communism in its full form is defeated. Nazism and its, you know, fascism in its full form is defeated. And so, you know, what, what I think he would say and what, what, what Tom Holland says today, uh, right, is that we, we, we live, we, we still live basically in a Christian, a Judeo Christian or Christian society. Yeah. We still, we live in a, we live in a secularized Christian society. Um, somebody made the point. It's like, um, you know, it's like everybody, it's like, it's, you know, everybody on their deathbed, like, prays to God, but, like, if the Pope, like, cuts his foot really badly on his, like, fancy slippers, he goes to the hospital, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> we're, we're all kind of in this, like, weird, like, you know, we're sort of Christian, we're sort of not Christian, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of this, this sort of, uh, right, you know, sort of rationalist version of, of, of inter, uh, underlying idea, or, you know, secular humanism kind of version of Christianity. Um, but, you know, to Holland's point, like, it, it's still, it, it, it's still the Christian ethos, right? And, and so it basically, it's still, it's still, it's the secularized version. We live in a world characterized by the secularized version of Christianity. We live in a world, therefore, characterized by what Nietzsche called slave morality, which is carrying forward the morality of the slave and the weak, um, you know, into, into, uh, into our daily lives, you know, even though we are, you know, at least, you know, presumably, you know, these days far from either being slaves or from, from being weak in the historical sense. Um, and so, you know, we, we care, we carry basically weakness forward as our, as our greatest uh, moral virtue. And then to your point, like we just, we keep firing on that impulse. Right. And so we keep basically stretching. It's like, okay, I can't claim to be weak anymore because I don't have enough food. I can't claim to be weak anymore because I'm getting beaten by my, you know, my, my boss. I can't claim to be weak anymore because, you know, we, you know, passed, you know, civil rights legislation and so forth and so on. And so therefore I need to figure out new ways to either claim to be weak or I need to figure out new ways to claim to speak on behalf of the weak. And, and, and that's our, you know, obviously our, our dominant morality. Yeah, it's weird because if you look at a lot of like online debates, I mean, I, I've had this debate with Rod Dreher and it's weird if you look at like everyone is suffused with Christ as a central moral narrative to the West. And if you look at the actual debates, they're not debating the moral narrative. They're debating who to cast as Christ. <laughs> that's the debate. Who do we actually put on the cross? And whether it be a person of this category or in the case of Rod Dreher, who wrote a book about the priests under the Soviet Union, who obviously did suffer. Like at the end of the day, Rod Dreher and the woke left that he despises and rails against don't really disagree on the script. They just disagree on the casting to that script. That's the debate. Um, and we'll basically from that, right? We'll we'll basically we'll continue to come up with Christ-like victims. Like we, we as a right. society, will continue to generate martyrs, 
uh, we will get, you will continue, we will continue to have sort of mass, you know, it's kind of so, sociological, you know, whatever you want to call it, uh, <laughs> phenomena, <laughs> breakdowns, whatever, right, around martyrs. Um, you know, we, we will continue to have these, these sort of mass, you know, kind of elevated, you know, movements around, around martyrdom. Um, and, and basically that, that will repeat over and over and over and over again because we're basically playing out that Christ narrative, um, you know, just because we, because we, we quite literally don't know what else to do. And, and do we think that there are alternative ideologies today that are competing for that, or is it everything just some brand of Christianity, whether it's secular or religious? Well, so th this goes to the weird, you know, this this goes to the weird thesis, right? Which basically, and again, just to repeat, it's Western, you know, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, and and that sort of bundle of cultural characteristics kind of carries with it the morality that we're, you know, that we're talking about. And so then you've kind of got this question of like, okay. You know, much of the world today is weird. Like, you know, much of the world is is you know, uh, it, you know, has been kind of penetrated or, or you know, colonized by by this morality. Not yet all of it, <laughs> but like, you know, uh, American soft power, mass media, right? Uh, you know, and you know, hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, there were missionaries, right? That would go out and try to convert people to the you know to the weird morality of that time. You know, today we have social media. You know, we have movies, right? We have music. Um, you know, we have these you know amazing you know public figures uh, whose voices get broadcast all around the world. Um, and so, you know, the the proselytizing impulse of of Christianity is you know seems to me to be alive and well, um, and you know is 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 being spread as aggressively as possible by sort of the modern version of visionaries. So, like my bet would, I mean, my bet would be that you know we kind of this, this kind of takes the whole world. You know, lots of people from other cultures and speaking on behalf of other cultures tell me that's naive and that won't happen. But uh, you know, I American could. Empire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, that I believe in, but I, I can cite one exception to the rule of everyone becoming. There, there's one country broadly in the Western sphere that birth rates are still solid, has moved to the right, and has a solid sense of. Uh, purpose, and I have to say, there's one distinguishing characteristic about that about that country is that they stop reading the Bible at a certain point. And um, I'm talking about Israel, of course. Um, I'm 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 the representative of the global Jewish conspiracy. I think. Well, no, Eric is as well. Actually, you're part of yeah. the. We we both get. <laughs> I, I haven't you actually converted yet, or like, no, what? no, I have. I, no, so it's funny. My, demarcation happen. Yeah. Well, so. Um, Right. I don't have control of the space laser yet. You get that later. N nor, nor do I have access to the Nest thermometer that controls the weather. That's also like a later step. I actually, so it's, it's an odd story. My rabbi, well, I shouldn't name who it is. My rabbi switched synagogues. He didn't like SF synagogues. So he went to a Texas synagogue. You can imagine what happened. And so now I got to go to Texas. He's the, he's the Elon of rabbis. <laughs> he's the Elon of, he's the Elon of rabbi. Yeah. Basically he's the Elon of rabbis. Um, and so I have to go to Texas to go into the mikvah. I have to, I have to get both circumcised and go into the mikvah. I'm not joking. Everyone can squirm at once now, um, and that's the actual transition process. So that's that's. So that's, you're you're, you're going to do it? That I'm going to do it. I'm going to pull the trigger. That's when I get. That's when I can control the space laser. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, sorry, but, but sorry, I tried to throw everything for a loop. We're talking about 1K. Um, you got Thank the you acronym wrong on the notes, Eric. Um, oh, what the circumcision thing? Yeah, sorry. Anyhow, I don't think you're supposed to talk about the notes. <laughs> okay. Got, oh yeah, the notes don't exist. What sorry. Notes? This is all. What notes? Just fun, fun. This, this is. This, yeah, sorry. Um, I got her. Yeah. Yeah. One K. Hey, there, even I mean the Lindy Man. That that's, uh, that's a score <laughs> point for Antonio. Anyways. We we have a bit of a history there. I felt bad about that. Um, for those who don't understand, he was plagiarizing my Substack, and I complained. And I don't know where he is now, but. I think he is right. Can you define what it is, Eric? What the what the, the one thousand year American empire is that it? Yeah, no one K Y A E. I think is what it is. One, one K Y E. Um, yeah. And so, what makes like to Dan's questions like? Well, I guess to zoom out is it, interesting. I read a op ed uh, in the New York Times by Michelle Goldberg lamenting that TV shows as of late don't have enough politics in them. Um, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Has she watched White Lotus? Yeah, exactly. That's what she's referring to. She's like, um, you know, the, 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 the misogynistic guys don't get the, they, like they end up fine. Um, mm. And, mm. you know, Mark went on this uh, podcast, Richard Hanania talking about TV shows. And, and Mark was saying that there aren't any like Nietzschean heroes in, in, in TV shows. Like you're, you're only allowed to have certain morality tales, but perhaps, perhaps it's diversifying. So, uh, yeah. So should we start with, should we start with that and then come back to one KYE? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so basically, yeah. So, so, okay. So the dominant morality of the time is, you know, is, is, is slave morality, right. Um, uh, which, 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 which we talked about. And so like every story basically that wants to get told is kind of the, you know, the, the victim story. And, you know, at, and at some point the victim stories get old, like at some point, especially as a form of entertainment, like the victim so stories are, you know, sad and, you know, kind of, 
you know, th- by, by the way, you know, there's whole sections of like, you know, pop literature that basically are these victim stories, right? Every once in a while, there'll be this, you know, you know there'll be some best-selling author or something who has some life story of just like complete degradation and, and, and shame and, you know, writes a best-selling book and everybody feels terrible. And then it turns out, you know, they made the whole thing up, right? Um, and so, you know, th- you know, th- there, there is that kind of entertainment if you want it. Um, uh, you know, there is, you know, kind of a, a, a form of entertainment that's like much more fun to actually watch, which is more of a, of a, you know, sort of a, of a, of a hero narrative. Um, you know, the, the, the hero negative, the hero narrative though always, you know, kind of c- c- runs the risk of coming across as cloying. Right. And so it's like, okay, this is like a wonderful person doing wonderful things. Okay. At some point that that's kind of dull. Um, and then, so, so, so that's led to the rise in the last, you know, 20 years or so on TV of the sort of anti-hero narrative, right? And so the, you know, the Tony Soprano, the Walter White, the Don Draper, um, you know, um, all, you know, all, all, all of these examples. And so it's like a guy who is, you know, or a woman who's kind of, you know, morally bad, but like really fun, interesting to watch, um, you know, doing like, you know, basically big and interesting things. Um, and then there's, there's, there's always this like conflict as you're watching the show, which is like, okay, am I supposed to be identifying with this person? Am I supposed to be cheering for this person? Am I, am I supposed to be, you know, condemning this person? Um, and so, uh, you know, it's like, you know, Walter, it's like Breaking Bad, like Walter White is like a great example. Like, is he, he's clearly the protagonist of the show. It, it, you know, he, he is, uh, you know, obviously a, by modern morality standards, a horrible person, right? Doing horrible things in the world. Um, you know, but yet he's this dynamic driving force, right? Trying to build a drug empire and you, you kind of find yourself cheering him on. Um, and so it's like, okay, well, what, you know, what, what, you know, what, what basically is, is happening there. And my argument basically is the, the, the anti-hero is the version of the Nietzschean Superman, um, that we are allowed to have, right? So we are allowed to have the portrayal of somebody who is larger than life and dynamic and an empire builder and somebody who vanquishes his enemies, right? And somebody who does great things, right? Um, as long as that person is fundamentally bad by standards of our modern, uh, of our modern morality, as long as they're doing something that in the end we, we judge as net destructive. What we're not allowed to have is the full version of the Nietzsche Superman doing something, you know, outstanding, right? So we're not allowed to have Napoleon-like figures, right? We're not allowed to have, you know, the building of the pyramids, right? We're not, we're not allowed to, we're not allowed to have, you know, Beethoven. We're not, we're not allowed to have the stories or, or even, you know, even, I mean, even, or even, you know, even business builders, like we're not allowed to have the story of the kind of person who like built the transcontinental railroad, right? Or the kind of person who built, you know, the, you know, the car industry or like, you know, any of those things, like those narratives basically are just completely gone. Um, because they're so out of step with, with, with our times and with our conception of morality. Basically, Top Gun was robbed at the Academy Awards, right? That's, that's, <laughs> that's one example, for example. Well, right? right. Every once in a while, you get a glimpse, right? You get, you get it, right. You get a glimpse of a world in which, right, you know, a hero like that would actually exist. Um, right. Uh, now, now the full Nietzschean Superman is, is even a step further beyond Top Gun, right? The full Nietzsche, Nietzschean Superman, uh, is somebody who is, you know, basically lives master morality fully, which basically says, I'm going to do the thing that I'm going to do, um, even if it runs, you know, right over a lot of our, you know, sort of modern Western conceptions of morality. Like, I'm going to accomplish something great, even if it's a terrible expense, but it is really going to be great. Like, there really are going to be pyramids, right? Um, uh, you know, I really am going to take over the world, um, uh, and, you know, rule it and, and rule it much better. Um, and, and, the, and those, narr- those narratives are just gone. Like they, you know, the, the, they just simply don't exist. You know, they, and I would argue, like from a cultural, like they're too scary, right? They're just, they're just, they're absolutely frightening. Because if we rediscovered that kind of morality, like it would, it would upend our entire order. Well, do, we, do we even think there would be anyone to write like high quality right. stuff for that at this point? I mean, it's just not in vogue at all to yeah. tell that story. Right. Well, yeah. it, it would require a Nietzsche and Superman <laughs> writer or <a> Chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it would require the full, yes, the, the, the unchained uh, version of ChatGPT could probably do it. The, ver- the version we have could definitely not do it, but the full, the, the full version might be able to do it. What's ironic is that three of the most, if not the most popular individuals on the planet, um, you know, kind of represent this to some degree, you know, uh, Trump, Kanye, and Elon, certainly the opposite of, of slave morality and, and perhaps you know, uh, uh, very controversial for the reasons reason you mentioned. They go against, you know, instinctive modes of morality. Yeah, this this triple used to make this triple used to be uh, easier to use. Um, <laughs> 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 it's gotten somewhat more difficult in recent months. Yeah. Um, you know, I look. I, I think you can map Elon into this too. Uh, you know, so focus on him for a second. Like, you know, and, and, you know, and I think he generates the kind of reaction that you'd expect given the the morality framework that we've been talking about, which is he's, he's a guy who's just like, look, I'm just, I don't care what people say. I'm just going to like build. I'm going to build a new car company. I mean, I know it's you know everybody says it's impossible to build a new car company. Um, and on top of that, I'm going to build, you know, the ultimate robot, you know, electric, you know, self-driving car. 
Um, and I don't care what anybody's, I'm just going to do it. Um, you know, and then he says, you know, the same thing for rockets. And now he says, you know, the same thing for Twitter and, you know, three other things. Um, and so, you know, yeah, he's, he's like the, you know, he's, he's the modern version, um, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, he, he's the closest we can get to this now, you know, it is significant, like from a, from a, if you look at it through this kind of moral lens, you know, it is significant that he's, that he himself, right. Still, you know, kind of, uh, you know, and, and I, by the way, I, I believe that he believes this, so I'm not questioning him, but. Um, you know, he, he kind of, he, he, he dresses it in a, in a, in the, in the, in the sort of, you know, Christianized slave morality, you know, kind of ethos, right? So why, why, why do Tesla? Well, because, you know, climate change, right? Um, and so he, he, you know, he's, he's got sort of that still kind of underlying appeal to kind of modern, you know, Christianity, secularized Christianity, progressivism, our current, you know, kind of civil religion. Um, you know, but look, it, you know, <laughs> there was, there was some period of time where that kind of got him off the hook maybe a little bit from people who otherwise would have criticized him. It seems like that does not have buffer against people criticizing him at this point. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're seeing maybe a more pure version of the Nietzschean Superman today, um, than, than we've seen in quite a while. I, I mean, part of the deal with Twitter, can we discuss Burnham in this podcast or is Burnham yeah. off limits? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, we, I had that. We, we, we are going to take our total number of viewers from two down to zero at some point. <laughs> How many, how many more books? We want to talk ancient city after. <laughs> um, you know, I, I had this viral tweet thread, which, which got quoted in uh, Kevin Roos's thing about, which I didn't even read. And by the way, I didn't even know I was quoted. That's how, that's how upstream we are of the New York Times that only somebody mentioned that I got quoted that I like, Oh, I guess so. I didn't, I wouldn't have noticed otherwise. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Basically, it was framing the whole Elon thing in like Burnham's managerial elite book, which I think was on your best books to read, Mark, right? I think you that was on your list. Um, it's worth noting Burnham was a former Trotskyite who went conservative somewhere in there. And he wrote this interesting book, which uh, the, whole, the whole point is about the rise of the PMC, which is a professional managerial class. Lash wrote about it. Michael Linz has written about it. It's not a new concept. But I sort of framed the whole Elon thing as the, the weird thing about the Burnham thesis, right, is that traditionally under Marxism or like bourgeois capitalism, the, the owners and the bourgeois, the enemy of the people were the same person, right? But the decoupling that's happened is that capital and the PMC are not necessarily the same people with the same interests, right? It's why you can see sort of weird social, you know, woke revolts at companies against management. And it's, but you know, it's not actually somebody working in a coal mine, right? It's somebody who's like the middle management at these companies who demands a different political agenda than the founding class would actually want. I think Coinbase is another good example in which Brian Armstrong just said, well, uh, we're just not going to, we're just not going to discuss this at work. And if you don't like it, there's the door. Um, and Elon has basically come in and basically fired a lot of the PMC. And I, I think he, he put into very sharp relief the fact that the Elons of the world and their interests are not necessarily those of the L5 engineer or product manager who works for him, right? Um, Let alone like right? George Hotz showing up for a month and, and <laughs> like, it's just like that, that is, is incompatible with the PMC right. operating procedures, you know, processing right. procedures. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, it's, it's worth noting, like, how much we live in the world that Burnham described, this sort of PMC, this managerial class, right? So, right. Take, you know, take, take a really big company. You know, maybe a big search engine company starts with a G. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the Burnham thesis, right, is, you know, ownership is dispersed, right? And so, you know, who owns Google? The answer is, you know, a million people, including probably, you know, all of us in some accounts somewhere, um, you know, retirement accounts, 401ks, index funds. Uh, you know, not, by the way, you know, Google still has the, you know, nominal founder control, although, you know, in practice, that doesn't seem to really factor, factor into much anymore. The, those guys seem pretty, pretty tuned out. So, so it's, it's, it's become more like a, you know, more like a, more like a normal company. And so, so ownership is dispersed. And then, and then, right, there's a management class, uh, a PMC managerial class at Google, uh, of, you know, basically hired executives, um, who run, who run the company on, and, and, and it's a, it's, this is a classic Burnham formulation of you've got a dispersed base of owners. Um, and then you've got a concentrated group of managers. Um, and so of course the managers are dominant, right, over the owners, which is the reverse of, of, of what you would think from, from the economics. Um, and so you've got this PMC managerial class of managers at Google. You also, there, you also, however, this is very important. You also have that same class of shareholders, right? So you have, you know, Larry, Larry Fink is kind of the living embodiment of this, but there are many others. You, you've got these large scale, um, you know, asset management firms that aggregate up lots of individual shareholders. And then those asset management firms like BlackRock and others, right, are controlled by a certain class of, man a certain class of, again, manager. Um, and that manager basically has the ability to speak, you know, uh, in terms of policy on, on behalf of this, this distributed base of owners. Um, and so you've, you've got this, it, the, the modern kind of Fortune 500 company is you've got basically the PMC in charge at the manager, at the manager level of the company, but also at the shareholder level, right? So you've actually got this like sandwich, um, of, 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 of managerialism, sort of abstracted managerialism and therefore principal agent problems, 
um, you know, kind of running running these companies. And so, and, th and that's why these companies kind of you know do 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 all the things um, that they do. You know, to, to your point, like e Elon is the throwback. Like in in, in Bernard's framework, Elon is the throwback. He's the is the throwback to the pre managerial what what Bernard would call the, the bourgeois capitalist, which is to say the owner who actually runs the company. And you know, with Twitter, that's like definitely the case. Like <laughs> he literally owns the company. It's it's just him. Um, you know, there are some minority shareholders, including us. But like you know, he's in charge. Um, you know, his name is you know on the door. Um, and he's in there and he's running it and he just like, you know, tells people what to do and like, there's no board and there's no, none of this other stuff. Like, it's just like the guy in charge. Um, and, and by the way, the guy in charge model is basically how like the entire world up until like, you know, 1940 or whatever was built. It's, it's how like the, you know, the railroads were built and it's how every, you know, basically countries were formed and cities were created and, you know, how kind of everything great in the world happened up until a certain point. It's less common today, but he, you know, he he is the best living embodiment of that, and that's why he has to go. By the way, obviously, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's he's an, ins <laughs> he's an insult to the system. That's right. He's an insult to the system, right? And, and and anybody who's in the managerial class, right? The theory goes basically looks at him and says, you know, this is the this is the alien element. Like the, this is the thing that we were supposed to replace. This is the thing. You know, this is the thing. If 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 these people ever rose up again and came at us, they would just reassert control of everything, and we would be out on the street. Uh, right. Um, and so, yeah, the, 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 this can't happen. We, we, we cannot have the Nietzsche and Superman bourgeois capitalist operating in our society. Uh, we simply can't tolerate it. Now, I, I would argue we need it. Right. Um, and I would argue, you know, Elon's an example, but there are many other examples in the tech industry of, of sort of, uh, you know, versions of you know, people who are like that or aspire, aspire to be like that. You know, we, we need them to exist because without Elon, we don't get Tesla. Without Elon, we don't get SpaceX. Without, you know, the kind of founders that, you know, that we work with, you know, we don't, you, we don't, you don't get all the new inventions. Um, you know, that actually power things forward, right? The, the managerial class does not invent new things. Like they, they manage, <laughs> you know, they don't create. Um, and so if we ever want anything new ever again, it has to be this model where somebody basically adopts this, you know, older, you know, method of operating and says, look, I'm in charge. I'm going to do it. I'm going to tell people what to do. I'm going to make the decisions. I'm going to drive it forward. We're not going to have committees and, you know, uh, all these, you know, all, all, all these other, you know, kind of super, superfluous structures. We're just going to do the work. And we're going to have a command and control hierarchy. Um, and so, so we, we do need these people to kind of either come back, right? Or, you know, we need them to appear again. Um, you know, there is something in human nature. A certain number of people are born each generation that want to do something great. Um, and so there is something in human nature where these people do keep showing up. Um, but, um, you know, I would argue we, we, we need more of them. And then I, I would argue we need to encourage them more uh, as they appear. So if Burnham helps explain the managerial economy, um, and, uh, you know, Henrik helps explain why, um, you know, we're going to weirdify the world or why the rest of the world is going to become, you know, this is where Fukuyama comes in, more liberal, democratic. Um, you know, observers over the past decade or a couple decades have remarked that um, maybe the, some parts of the world don't want to become as weird as, as we might have thought. Or, or maybe it's, it's harder for them to complete that transition, as, as we would have thought. And this gets back to 1KYE. Is that, is that just a matter of time or are, 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 do some cult countries or cultures actually have cultural immunity to, to weird and what determines, you know, who, who wins that battle between weird and kind of a, a host, host culture? I think part of what is attractive about weird, pe people want the goodies that weird bring, right? They want the wealth. They want the, cons the consumerist society. I think the other aspects of weird, which is like free speech rights, like the sort of elevated... Uh, you know, ethereal rights encoded in the Constitution. Like, I think we flatter ourselves thinking that the entire world wants to live in an American style democratic republic. <laughs> like, I, I don't think that's actually true. Um, I, I think they want a lot of freedom. I think they want the consumption. I think they want the wealth. Um, I, I don't know if, if Americans even want American style democracy anymore, right? It's, it's a hard democracy is hard, right? You have to put up, you have to listen to other people who disagree with you. You have to give equal dignity to everybody, right? It violates so many formative narratives in, in that are part of many people's sort of inherent constitutions. I, I, I don't know. I, I think, I think weirdness is a hard sell. And if you look, I mean, the bear case on the U.S. imposing liberalism on the world is that it utterly failed in countries like Afghanistan and Iraq, right? It was a total failure. Like how many, how much weird residue is there left in those countries now that the United States has left? I would say probably not much. Um, and in fact, the recent news out of Afghanistan is they just banned women in schools, for example, right? That was the legacy of the American occupation. Or well, that's because they cut the diversity initiatives. Uh, they, they yeah, kept, yes, yes, yes. They kept them. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm, I'm, it sounds like the Taliban weren't being on the DEI front. <laughs> well, um, Biden's new yeah. plan or whatever. The new plan just needs more, more you know, money allocated there. Then it'll, it'll happen. Yeah. Anyhow, 
Um, but, but, yeah. in, in, but I feel like in some ways, though, exposure to the internet is the ultimate. Like if you take the idea of books changing the way the brain works uh, in, in text, and then you just put it in a piece of glass in front of you all the time, and anyone in the world has that, uh, maybe outside of a country like China, full access to Wikipedia and everything else, uh, I think it's going to be a pretty levelizing force, no? Like in terms of it's just exporting the the 1KYAE, as we'd say. I mean, I Iran, think... Iran being a good example, by the way, right? Where there's a lot of, there's a mass movement now against their current political order, which for some reason is not getting a lot of play in the US, which I don't like. So I'm, I'm like name dropping it. But in Iran, you're, you're right, right? The, the internet is kind of infiltrating weird values in a way that the local power structure doesn't like. Yeah, and I just, friends of mine just got back from Saudi and they basically report, like Saudi Arabia apparently, from a social standpoint, has been completely transformed in the last five years. And, you know, it's like men and women, you know, together in public, you know, who don't, you know, who aren't related. It's, you know, women driving and working. And it's it's kind of all these Western, you know, kind of things all of a sudden kicking in, um, you know, under 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 the, the, the new leadership. Um, the, the most interesting thing about the Afghanistan thing to me was, um, you know, obviously, you know, banning women from school or whatever is a throwback to the old, you know, kind of the old, the old ways, uh, of, you know, of, of the Taliban kind of pre, pre 2001. Um, but there, there is a big difference. <laughs> Taliban 2.0, um, in charge today, there is a big difference. Um, and it, it's not necessarily showing up in their behaviors, but it is visible, um, which is they all have phones now. Um, <laughs> right. To, you know, Dan, to your point, like, Taliban 2001, if you look at all the photos, like they're not carrying around cell phones. Um, if you look at the photos in 2021, when they came back in power, they've all got phones. Um, and there were, there were a bunch of articles where, you know, they're, they're, you know, especially the younger Taliban members were interviewed about it. And it's like, yeah, I'm, you know, fully signed up for this whole program. But by the way, I've got my, you know, I'm following the, you know, the whatever the, you know, soccer and, you know, sports and music and like all the Western stuff on my, um, on my phone. And so I, I, th I think that, the, the, the question with this, you know, the, the, the core question is like, basically, do we get the kids, right? Um, and so, um, you know, there's sort of like the older generation, you know, will not change. The, the sort of, you know, younger generation of adults is kind of, you know, a, a hinge generation that's kind of, you know, neither here nor there, maybe. And then, you know, somebody who's, you know, somebody who's five today, um, you know, living in a, even a, what we would consider to be a very repressive society, it, you know, if, if it turns out they do have access to a phone. Um, and so therefore they have access to Western culture. And so therefore they grow up with our, you know, our conception of culture and then therefore our conception of morality, you know, kind of coming through the screen. Um, you know, how, how long does it take for the broader culture to, uh, to change, to conform to that? Yeah. Outside of a great wall of China, I feel like most of these countries just don't have the ability. And now, now Elon with Starlink, Antonio, your favorite, uh, <laughs> read of all time, but you shake your fist in the sky. I mean, <laughs> yes, just 10 years from now, you have a phone that's potentially talking to a satellite. Good luck filtering that. And, and I mean, you, you could talk all you want about like, okay, what are the reasons for the fall of Soviet Union? But like the, the quip is blue jeans and, and Western pop music, right? So like, I think the the accelerant of these phones and, and if you do actually get to a satellite-based internet uh, that just can happen for anybody, I think it's really hard to avoid it, even, even in a country like China. What does someone like our good friend um, Balaji not appreciate about kind of American or, or, or weird influence and its ability to to penetrate or, or, or permeate the rest of the world. Like if you, if you were here, what, what would his, his argument against it be? Against weird or for weird? Against, uh, weird. against weird. He doesn't yeah. think it's that powerful. Mm. Or inevitable. Mm. I think that it induces a stasis that can't do anything, right? His constant quip is that the U.S. can't build anymore, or very few parts of the U.S. can build anymore. Um, I think he would probably claim that. Um, yeah, he would. Yeah, he would basically say, "Yeah, look at us. We're mired in politics. Um, you know, we're mired in stagnation. Um, you know, we, we've got. You know, we've, 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 we've we have a system that somehow puts the worst people in our society in charge, right? Um, and maybe there's some some evidence for that. Um, and so, uh, you know, right? His, you know, his hero. Who are his heroes? Like, you know, um, uh, Lee Kuan Yew. Right. Uh, as an example. Right. So, um, uh, you know, we, we, we you know, what we, we you know, a properly run society would, would prize excellence um, and would prize, you know, education and would, would, would prize achievement. Um, and I, I don't know that he would use Nietzschean phrasing, but he, he, you know, he would he would lean much harder into this kind of master morality, um, you know, kind of thing. And he would he would find, you know, he finds Western society very, um, you know, very lacking. Uh, and by the way, you know, he's, he's a good friend of all of ours and he's a super genius and yeah. everybody should read his book. The, you know, the, the, the kind of biggest disagreement he and I always have is that, um, you know, his, 
<laughs> his arguments on this are, are precisely American, right? Like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Like he, he, he has the, you know, what, what is, what is, what is, you know, maybe the ultimate cultural hall, hallmark of Americanism is it's, it's self-criticism, right? It's, it's this, you know, constant self-critical, you know, kind of thing about how terrible our society is and about how terrible our politics are and about how terrible our culture is and how terrible, you know, and how, you know, just like awful everything is. Uh, it's like the national sport, right? Uh, is to kind of attack ourselves like that. Um, and he is, he is, a, he is enthusiastically on board with the self-criticism program. The, yeah. the one thing I would quit uh, with biology on is our, our vaccines do, do work. Um, <laughs> like it's, uh, uh, but no, I, I think, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's see, let's see if we can get, let's see if we can get Eric's, uh, Eric's uh, YouTube show, uh, banned, uh, on the first episode. <laughs> first, first episode. No, but I, I, I think that to biology's credit though, what I like to say, biology and I disagree on a lot of things on this, especially when it, you know, biology Zion, and I think he, he offers an alternative on pretty much every point, And we've talked at, you know, a ton about this, Eric. But I do think one one thing I give a lot of credit to Balji is he actually has a, a differentiated point of view and he actually put it down on paper and, and and put it said like, okay, this is actually what I believe in and 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 put it down. And so I think um do I agree whether that's gonna happen or not? No, but it, it's worth everyone to read it and then come to their own opinion on it. And I think there's a lot of elements of the network state that are, are really interesting and influential in what I'm doing day to day. So like I, I think um on one, any one point in particular, we don't necessarily have to agree, but like, I, I think his, his, his viewpoint is worthwhile. And, and, oh, and for sure. Yeah. SecureFrame is the leading all-in-one platform for security and privacy compliance. SecureFrame helps you get SOC 2 audit ready in weeks, not months. And it's used by thousands of companies like AngelList, Coda, and Remote. I believe in the company so much I invested in it, and I recommend it to all my portfolio companies. Sign up for a free demo at secureframe.com and mention Moment of Zen during your demo to get 20% off your first year of secure frame. I, I'm glad I'm glad you named it by name, Dan. So we're talking about the network state, his book, which I reviewed, and it is also available online in this actually really nicely formatted website that you can keep on reading his new additions to it. Well, he's I, constantly I'm, he's you know yeah, he's, 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 it's like like let's not just ship this thing on a CD-ROM. It's like you know SAS. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I positively re reviewed the network state for for Tablet Magazine. I, I thought it was good, right? And like the biggest argument for the network state is that. We're living in it, right? Like the reality is we're already there. If you take the three or four neighborhoods in San Francisco or the three or four neighborhoods in LA and New York, like if it existed right now with actual borders and passports and all the rest of it, would you even notice it? No, because you'd never leave it, right? I mean, I occasionally go, um, you know, act like a red state or a Nevada or whatever, but broadly speaking, nobody else on this call would like probably ever leave that network state. <laughs> or, right? or visit war zones. <laughs> or visit war zones, for example. Yeah, I have to, I have to go out into the real world and, and come back with news of the horrors that lurk outside the network state. But it's already kind of there, right? And it's, um, yeah. Although I am skeptical of that ever actually becoming like an actual polity because I don't know. We, we need a leader to get us there. And Balaji doesn't seem to want to assume cult guru status. <laughs> and so well, he, he would argue that you need leaders, right? Like there shouldn't be one singular leader there. And I, yeah. my thing of the network state is, I just think the network state is all, all these proliferation of group chats, and yeah. slowly, slowly working their way up to, to nationhood. Um, which is a good question, by the way. Can we can we switch to Twitter for just one second, Eric? Because so there's a whole Twitter versus Mastodon today, and even I was snarking about Mastodon today about people who like make all this noise, go to Mastodon, and then post a link to their Mastodon thread in Twitter so that it gets engagement, which is like the most anticlimactic thing ever. But I think long term, it, it is the case if you buy the the full biology vision, it is the case that you're going to end up with decentralized and fragmented media, right? You're not going to have center court at Wimbledon with all the elites in one coliseum, like dunking on each other like you do in Twitter, you're going to have this breakaway thing. Um, and I hear there's this thing called Farcaster, Dan. This is not a plug, by the way, for your thing, but it, yours is like the first sort of real case of decentralized media, right? No, Maybe. I mean, there, there are other, other examples. I mean, right. one, one of many. But I, but I think um, to your point, Antonio, the, the interesting thing is like everyone wants to say that they're leaving all these different platforms. And then the reveal preference is they all use Twitter for their distribution. <laughs> So it's like, right, okay, Twitter doesn't have to host all of your, your content or your video or whatever, but you're right. still going to post on Twitter to actually get the distribution. And so um, as someone who is very much in this space, I think that network effect is extremely difficult to break. And every single person who says that they're leaving Twitter and then posts the link to leaving Twitter on Twitter is just furthering that network effect. So I, I think uh, they have a ways to go before, before that unravels. But how about, and I, I have this question for Mark, because I'm, I'm sure you've thought about it. Like, what happens if a society can't share a social network? Can they share a government? Can they share a nation? Like, what happens next? Because if 
you know, if our social networks actually define our intellectual lives, the, the, like at some point, our intellectual and cultural lives, we've had this conversation before, right? The uncoupling of information from how stuff moves around the world, right? Led to the fact that like our narratives don't follow the linguistic and political borders that define our political reality, right? We've, we've turned it around, right? Like we, we, we act in groups that have nothing to do. Like we're all in different cities, I imagine, right? What happens when, when that, when we maximize that and the, the people that we talk to and, 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 and talk with have, have no shared political structure around them? What, what comes next? Yeah, I mean, look, my, my reading of it, and again, this kind of goes to the question of what, what is American, like my, my reading of American history is like, we've never actually had what, you know, kind of what you're describing, right? And so, you know, this, is, this has always been a country in which you've had people with like, and, and groups with like wildly divergent, wildly divergent views um, on how things should be ordered. And, you know, if you go back and read about, you know, elections that took place in the, you know, 1800, and, you know, and, and then, you know, all the way through the, the 19th century, and <laughs> all the way through the first half of the 20th century, like, you know, there, there were even bigger internal fights, you know, than we, than we have now. You know, with 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 you know even more kind of potent issues, uh, and, and actually with a lot more physical violence, um, you know, kind of associated with it. And so, you know, you could kind of say like the the the, the genius of the American system is its ability to basically you know have these fights actually take place. Um, you know, they they did metastasize in a full civil war once, you know, which was a big deal. But you know, it it, it you know it happened once. It, it got put to bed. It, it hasn't happened again since you know since you know in one hundred and you know fifty plus years. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the ultimate defense of the American system is, is we can be fractious, like the, the, the system actually lets us be fractious and, and lets the republic hold together. Um, you know, look, the, you know, the, the obvious, again, the, the obvious counter argument to that is the biology argument, which is, yeah, you're just mired in conflict all the time. You're not getting anything done. You know, the, my, my biggest defense of the American system would be that it's, it's sort of, it, it's, it's, it's consistent with the, the process of evolution, right? So, um, we, we can evolve, uh, you know, this is the same way that, 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 that life evolves because we can actually have the fight, right? We can actually have the, the conflict. We can actually have the argument. Um, and we can actually, you know, lit litigate it all the way out and we can see, you know, whose ideas, you know, wh whose ideas make it and whose ideas get incorporated and, and that, you know, basically progress happens through evolution. Evolution happens through conflict. Um, and we as a society are, are very, very good. Generally, uh, we're very good at having a high level of conflict without the whole thing falling apart. Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of argument to biology, right? That at the end of the day, liberal democracy actually just like lasts longer, right? Like the U.S. is actually chided for being so young, but actually it's not. American institutions are way older than American ones. Spanish democracy is younger than me. Um, Italy and Germany were unified after the state of Florida existed, right? We've actually had very long, long lasting institutions, right? The longest experiment in democracy is the United States. And I think it's precisely what, what you're hinting at, Mark, right? Which is that we can actually evolve to things. The, the counter counter argument to that, though, is like, yes, in the past, we had things like Utah, right, which is basically run like a theocracy until relatively recently it was this weird Mormon experiment. But what we're having now, I just read this book called, I think, I don't think I've ever mentioned it, Revolution is a very short introduction by Jack Goldstone. And he mentioned that revolutions actually happen when a sub part of the elite says, like, this system no longer works for us. <laughs> like, we're actually breaking away. Like, it's never the case that the working classes actually revolt. It's like a subset of the elites, and like the French Revolution being a classic example, in which they actually revolt against, they become class traitors and actually revolt against the very system that produced them. And that's when you get, I mean, Fidel Castro was from a very wealthy family who went to a, a fancy boarding school. He was not a man of the people at all, right? And so what, what we see on Twitter is that cleaving of, of the elites, which to, why, to me, it's slightly more alarming than some of the political turmoil we've had in the past. Yeah, I just think we need a lot more of that, right? Like, <laughs> mark, mark me down as strongly pro, <laughs> right? Like, I would, we don't have nearly enough of that, right? Right, right now, the, the elite assimilation machine is working too well, right? Too, too many of the new, high, highly capable people in our society who either, you know, are born or are, you know, or come, or come here from other places, like too many of them just assimilate into the same, you know, basically the same, uh, you know, the exact same strain of, of sort of American, you know, post-Christian, you know, morality that we, you know, that we've been talking about. Um, you know, I, I think we actually need a much bigger fight among the elites. And Tony, when you mentioned that, it reminded me of a book I read when I was off uh, during 2020. Martin Malia, who I think is a late professor, did a lot on, on the Soviet Union. And he has a book, in, I think, History's Locomotives. And he actually just goes through starting Protestant Reformation and, and works his way through 1848 and, and, and you know, uh, Soviet Revolution and just talks about how it actually requires a certain chunk of elites and and common people to actually line up. Otherwise, people people have this uh, wrong notion of like it's elites versus this, and it's like no, you actually need yeah. elites to break off and right. and lead a, a, a mass group of people yeah. for actually to have a revolution happen. Yeah, that's right, and that's very consistent with Burnham. Yeah, it's it's very consistent, right? With uh, with Burnham also, which is yeah. It's basically right. Society, modern society is going to be oligarch. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a small number of highly, you know, highly educated, highly capable people, um, you know, basically determining what, what happens. Like that's just, you know, for reasons we could go into like that, that's just going to be the structure, con con a concentrated minority against a dispersed majority. 
uh, the concentrated minority is going to win. And then it's, it's basically a question of which concentrated minority is going to win. Um, and, and there's one category right now that is clearly winning. Um, and then I think there needs to be, there, there certainly needs to be a stronger alternative to that, if not, if not several alternatives to that. And, you know, that, that, that may be the most important thing for the next 30 years, you know, to happen in the country. And, you know, we'll, 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 we'll see if it does or not.